One of the biggest challenges in mycology is maintaining a sterile working environment, which is essential to eliminate contamination that could outcompete your mushroom mycelium. Starting out, most people, including myself, use a still air box. This is an effective budget option, and you can accomplish a lot with it. But as you progress, it often becomes tedious to set up and use properly, and presents difficulties when working with fruiting blocks and other larger items. Laminar flow hoods, on the other hand, provide a sterile workspace that's much easier to use and can virtually eliminate the possibility of contamination when used properly. A flow hood is basically just a box with a filter built into the front and a fan that blows air into the box and out the filter. When the air is pushed through the filter at just the right speed, it will produce an area of non-turbulent or laminar flow in front of the hood. This ensures that no stray particles get swept into your workspace, keeping your work clean. The problem is that commercially available flow hoods almost always come with huge price tags, and the ones that are big enough to do anything more than agar work with are often inaccessible to most mushroom growers. It's possible to make a functional flow hood on a tight budget using a plastic tote and a HEPA filter made for an air purifier, but I found that the air filters available to make this option were too small for the size flow hood that I wanted to build, and also wouldn't provide true laminar flow. That being said, true laminar flow isn't strictly necessary for mycology work, just a stream of clean air, so if you're on a tight budget and are okay with a smaller flow hood, this option can work for you. If you're looking to work with larger bags and tubs though, it's beneficial to have a larger flow hood that can provide laminar flow. In this video, I'll explain how to design a flow hood from the ground up, including component selection and other considerations, as well as giving you an overview of the build process. My goal is to create a high quality flow hood without sacrificing any performance, so this is by no means a budget option. The cost for this one came to just over $600, which is not cheap by any means, but much more manageable than the $1,000 plus options available for purchase. Building a flow hood requires a lot of prep work and careful component and material selection to ensure proper operation. So let's start by going over the materials I used. I'll explain how I chose each component throughout the video, so stay tuned for that. The heart and soul of any flow hood is the HEPA filter, and for this, I went with a two foot by two foot filter from NC Filtration. Next, we need a fan to push air through this filter, so I chose the AC Infinity Cloudline S10 inline fan for this purpose. I also added a pre-filter to this build to remove any bigger particles from the air before it even enters the hood, so I picked up these MERV 11 furnace filters. To construct the box that houses the filter and fan, I purchased a 4x8 foot sheet of 23 30 seconds of an inch sanded pine plywood, as well as three 1x2 inch pine furring strips. While I was at the hardware store, I also picked up some wood primer and gloss paint, some silicone sealant to seal any cracks in the box, two inch cabinetry screws to fasten the plywood together, and one and a quarter inch screws to attach the furring strips. This brought the total for materials to $637.78, which includes an extra pre-filter. So with the materials secured, let's roll the construction footage while I talk about how I landed on each component. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the nitty gritty construction because it will vary based on the design you choose, but if you're interested, I'll have the detailed plans I made for this project in the description, which you can use as a reference for your build. I'm starting out by cutting my plywood and furring strips to size. All these pieces are designed to snugly fit my two x two foot filter, so your measurements will vary based on the filter size you choose. If you're gonna go through the effort of building a flow hood this way, I'd recommend making it at least two feet by two feet, as this is big enough to do most mycology work, including making fruiting blocks and larger monotubs. Two by four foot is another common option and would provide an even bigger working area, but will require a more powerful fan and cost more. Two by two ended up being perfect for my application and also offered cost and space savings over the two by four foot build. In order for the flow hood to operate correctly, you need to ensure that the HEPA filter and fan are compatible. We need the air coming out of the filter to be moving at 100 feet per minute in order to achieve laminar flow, and making this happen requires a bit of due diligence. The HEPA filter is the first thing you'll want to purchase. I'd recommend choosing one that is 5 to 6 inches thick and has a filtration efficiency of at least 99.97% down to 0.3 microns. You'll likely come across filters that are 11 inches thick, and while these can work, they're designed to scrub the air in industrial settings and aren't as good at producing laminar flow in these kinds of flow hoods. Next, you'll want to look at fans, and the main thing here is that it needs to be able to put out the correct airflow through your filter. Because air filters have resistance as the air passes through them, the pressure inside your flow hood will be greater than the ambient room pressure. Since the fan will need to work harder to blow air into the pressurized interior of the hood, we need to account for this pressure drop when choosing which one to get. Most filters specify the pressure drop on the packaging, but if yours doesn't, this type of 6 inch HEPA filter usually sits at around 1 inch of water. I'm also going to add another 0.2 to 0.3 inches of water to my calculation for the total pressure drop of the flow hood to account for the pre-filter. All in, the HEPA and pre-filter will produce a pressure drop of around 1.3 inches of water. 
This is a conservative estimate, and if you're using similar components, going off this number will probably work for you too. To calculate the airflow rate that our fan has to be able to maintain at 1.3 inches of water, we simply take the desired 100 feet per minute and multiply it by the area of our HEPA filter. My two foot by two foot filter is four square feet, so we simply multiply 100 feet per minute by four square feet to get our required airflow of 400 cubic feet per minute. Armed with this knowledge, we can start looking at fans. A lot of people use blower fans for this purpose, but in this build I'm gonna be using an inline fan. This allows me to house the fan inside of the flow hood itself, saving space and eliminating the need for a fan box, which is generally constructed around blower style fans to allow for pre-filtering. One thing to keep in mind when using an inline fan is that the plenum, or empty space in the flow hood behind the filter, must be made big enough to allow for an even distribution of pressure across the face of the filter. The easiest way to determine if a fan is powerful enough is to use its fan curve. This is a graph that shows the airflow that the fan can produce at different pressures, which makes it very easy to see if we can move enough CFM at your pressure. Here, for example, we find our pressure on the y-axis, and then we go across until we meet the curve and see that this fan can make around 200 CFM at 1.3 inches of water. Since this is less than the airflow we need, we know that this fan wouldn't work. Most inline fans that I looked at didn't come with a fan curve, so I had to do some deduction to see if they'd work. What they will usually disclose is the maximum CFM and the static pressure. The max CFM is the maximum airflow that the fan can produce under no pressure, and the static pressure is the pressure at which the airflow of the fan goes to zero. Conveniently, these values are equivalent to the two endpoints on a fan curve, and by comparing them to fan curves of similar fans, we can get a reasonable estimate of whether the fan will work. My Cloudline S10 fan has a max airflow of 1201 CFM and a static pressure of 4.25 inches of water. Going back to our sample fan curve, which is for a similar inline style fan, we can see that if we go to our required 400 CFM, we meet the curve at around 1.1 inches of water. Considering that this curve is for a fan with a static pressure of 1.65 inches of water and a max airflow of 950 CFM, we can safely assume that the S10 would be able to far exceed the 400 CFM we need at 1.3 inches of water, given its specs. This fan is probably overkill for this build, and I only got it because I found it for cheaper than the S8 model, which I would have gotten otherwise. The S8 has a max airflow of 807 CFM and a static pressure of 3 inches of water and given its much higher static pressure and comparable max airflow to our sample fan curve, it would also be able to comfortably make 400 CFM at 1.3 inches of water. This isn't a perfect way to determine fan compatibility, since fan curves don't necessarily transpose as simply as this, but I think it's good enough to get a rough idea of whether a fan will work or not. Because these inline fans are variable speed, which I consider a requirement for flow hood fans, we have some leeway in the power calculations and don't have to worry if we overshoot our required power. Another reason to get a variable speed fan is that the static pressure of a flow hood tends to increase over time as particles collect in the HEPA filter, and you may need to increase the speed setting on the fan over time to account for this. I settled on 23 30 seconds of an inch sanded ply for my box because it's easy to construct into an airtight structure and thick enough to absorb the vibrations of the fan. There are other materials you could use, but just make sure you choose something durable and easy to work with. The 1 by 2 inch pine furring strips I picked up will be used to construct a filter stop, which will keep the filter in place, as well as to reinforce my box, construct my pre-filter housing, and as the front trim for the box. Purchasing a hole saw that fits the diameter of your fan is hugely helpful for making the hole for it to sit in, but you can also just use a jigsaw for this job. aesthetic purposes, although I do think it made the final product look a lot more professional. Gloss paint is much easier to clean than raw wood, and will also provide a somewhat water-resistant barrier preventing mold from growing in the wood. I was originally planning on sealing all the inside edges of the box with silicone, but it ended up being pretty much airtight without it, so I only used it to seal the notch where the wires come out of the box. the flow had built. Now we need to calibrate the fan speed to make sure we get laminar flow. If you have an anemometer, you can easily use it to find the fan setting that gives you 100 feet per minute of flow. But if you don't, you can just hold a lighter in front of your hood and adjust your fan until the flame is blown at about a 45 degree angle from 6 inches away. 
I ran a test where I left two petri dishes open for five minutes, one in front of the hood and one not. The dish that wasn't in front of the hood developed lots of bacteria and mold within a week, as expected. But a month later, there are still no signs of contamination in the dish that was in front of the hood. This hood has made my mycological work so much easier, and I highly recommend anyone who wants to take their mushroom obsession to the next level to build one. I learned a ton from this build and made a lot of mistakes, but I'm thrilled with how it came out, and so far I've had no contamination whatsoever when working in front of it. There's a lot of information out there about flow hoods, some helpful and some not. I hope this video gives you a good idea of how to build one for mushroom cultivation, should you decide to embark on this journey yourself. Thank you.